Welcome to the third lesson in our series on chemical bonding. In this lesson, we will examine the work done by Linus Pauling and introduce you to a series of numbers which he developed. Pauling used this scale to describe the electrostatic forces exerted on the electrons held together in a bonding pair. He assigned a number to each of the common elements. These numbers are shown on some periodic tables next to the symbol for the elements. Pauling used these numbers to determine what sort of bonding would take place when two particular elements reacted together. The numbers Pauling used in his scale are known as electronegativity numbers. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain what the electronegativity number tells you about the electrostatic forces within a covalent bond. Use electronegativity numbers to identify the type of bonding taking place between two elements. Linus Pauling was really a most amazing man. He is the only person to be awarded two individual Nobel Prizes. He was awarded his first prize for his work on the nature of the chemical bond and later awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts in ending the testing of nuclear devices in the atmosphere. In 1925, Pauling won the Guggenheim Fellowship and left the United States to study in Germany. In Europe, he became interested in quantum mechanics. At that time, the quantum mechanical model was being used to describe the atom, but Pauling saw how this model could be used to describe chemical bonds formed between atoms. He showed how atomic orbitals of elements overlap to form a new molecular orbital which contains a shared pair of electrons called the bonding pair. Pauling's calculations showed that the distribution of electrons was not always even. Sometimes the electrons in the chemical bond spent more time closer to one atom than another. From his quantum mechanical calculations and general observations of the macroscopic nature of different compounds, Linus Pauling developed the scale of special numbers that we mentioned earlier which he called electronegativity numbers. These numbers described how strongly a particular atom would attract the bonding pair of electrons towards itself. He gave the element fluorine the highest number, 4,0, because whenever fluorine reacts, it pulls the electrons involved in the chemical bond closer to itself. Elements that were less likely to attract electrons in a chemical bond, like the metals, were given lower electronegativity numbers. If you look at the periodic table, you should be able to see some interesting trends in these electronegativity numbers. Look at the numbers in the second period. Can you see that the numbers increase from left to right? This makes good sense since the metals on the left-hand side of the periodic table are much less likely to hold on to electrons than non-metals on the right-hand side of the periodic table. Notice too that the noble gases of group 8 do not have an electronegativity number. This is because they never bond as their outer energy levels are filled. Now let's look at one example of how electronegativity numbers can be used to help us describe the type of bonding taking place. Chlorine is a diatomic molecule with a chemical formula of Cl2. Have a look at the Lewis diagram of this molecule. You can clearly see a single bond pair of electrons between the symbols for chlorine. Can you work out what type of orbital overlap is taking place here? Well, the energy level diagram of chlorine shows that there are seven valence electrons in the chlorine atom and that the unpaired electron is in a 3p orbital. This means that when chlorine molecules form, we have a pp head-on overlap to form a sigma covalent bond. Notice that in this model, there is only one bonding pair of electrons. However, all the orbitals that do not overlap also contain pairs of electrons. 
all the electrons in these pairs come from the same atom. These pairs of electrons from the same atom are called lone pairs. Now let's see how Pauling's electronegativity numbers can be used to tell us about what is happening to the bond pair of electrons. From the periodic table, we see that a chlorine atom has an electronegativity number of 3,0. This is a high value on the scale and means that the chlorine atom will try to pull the bond pair towards itself. But in the chlorine molecule, we have two chlorine atoms that both have the same electronegativity number. What do you predict will happen here? Before you answer this question, look at this tug of war as a model of what's happening to bonding pairs of electrons. Here, the ribbon represents the bonding pair of electrons. The forces applied to the ends of the rope represent the force that each atom exerts on the bonding pair. When identical force is applied to the end of a rope, the ribbon stays exactly the same distance away from each of the ends. Can you now predict how the bond pair will be shared? Well, from the tug-of-war model, I think you would all say that the bond pair is attracted equally by both the chlorine atoms. Notice that in this case, the difference in electronegativity numbers is zero. The electronegativity number difference, called the ENND, helps us decide how electrons are shared between atoms. Whenever the electronegativity number difference is zero, we can deduce that the electrons in the overlapping orbitals are distributed equally between the atoms. There are no regions within this bond that are more negative or more positive than any other. So the bond is called a nonpolar covalent bond. Pauling's electronegativity number difference can be used for all chemical bonds, even when there are double and triple bonds present. Can you use the electronegativity number difference to confirm the nature of the covalent bonding in the nitrogen molecule? The periodic table shows that a nitrogen atom has an electronegativity number of 3,0. Both atoms of the molecule have the same electronegativity number, so the ENND is 0. The bond is therefore nonpolar covalent. Now let's turn our attention to what happens when different elements combine to form compounds. Here, the electronegativity number difference is even more useful. Let's look at a molecule we have seen before, hydrogen chloride. In the previous lesson, we showed that in this molecule, there is one bond pair. We also showed that the orbital overlap was between a 1s orbital and a 3p orbital. Hydrogen's 1s orbital is much smaller than the 3p orbital of the chlorine. We showed that when these orbitals overlapped, there was an uneven distribution of electrons in the sigma bond. The electrons spend more of their time closer to the chlorine atom than to the hydrogen atom. This means that the chlorine end of the molecule becomes slightly negatively charged and the hydrogen end slightly positively charged. We described this bond as a polar covalent bond. Now let's use Pauling's electronegativity numbers to see if we can verify our original description. If we use the periodic table, we will find that hydrogen has an electronegativity number of 2,1 and chlorine an electronegativity number of 3,0. Remember, we said earlier that a useful model for using electronegativity numbers is thinking about a tug of war. In this case, the chlorine has the larger number and so must pull the bonding pair of electrons closer to itself. So the chlorine end of the molecule will be more negatively charged and as a result, the hydrogen end will be slightly positively charged. I think it is clear that by using electronegativity numbers, we can confirm that the bond found in the hydrogen chloride molecule is a polar covalent bond and not a nonpolar covalent bond. Pauling realized that there are in fact two extremes in the models used to describe chemical bonds. 
The One model, based on quantum mechanics and orbital overlaps, describes equal sharing of electrons to form nonpolar molecules. The other model is described by valence bond theory, when ionic bonds between positively charged metal ions and negatively charged non-metal ions form. Pauling's challenge was to take the strengths of both these models and develop a better overall model of bonding that worked for all compounds. To understand how he did this, let's look at the bonding found in the compound sodium chloride again and see if we can apply Pauling's electronegativity numbers in this case. We have shown that sodium chloride is formed when the sodium atom donates an electron to a chlorine atom. The sodium atom becomes positively charged and the chlorine forms a negatively charged chloride ion. There are strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the sodium ions and the chloride ions, holding the ions together in a giant lattice. From the periodic table, we find that the electronegativity number of sodium is 0, 0,9 and for chlorine it is 3,0. Clearly the chlorine will have a larger pull on the electrons involved in the chemical bond and so the chlorine atom will be negatively charged and the sodium atom will be positively charged. This does not contradict what we described earlier. In fact, it sounds very similar to our earlier description of hydrogen chloride as a polar covalent molecule. Is there any difference between an ionic lattice and a polar covalent molecule? Well, the answer lies in the size of the electronegativity number difference. In hydrogen chloride, the electronegativity number difference is 0,9. But in sodium chloride, the electronegativity number difference is 2,1. Hauling worked out a range of possible electronegativity number differences and compared these to the type of bonding taking place. Look at the graph of this relationship. When the ENND is zero, the molecule is considered to be 100% covalent or 0% ionic. Now as the percentage for ionic bonding increases, the electronegativity number difference also increases. On this scale, when the ENND is 1,7, the bond is more than 50% ionic. The largest electronegativity number difference occurs between cesium and fluorine. Here, the difference is 3,3, but even here, the percentage of ionic bonding is not 100%. So according to Pauling's models, you never get a 100% pure ionic substance. Even in cesium fluoride, the outer electron of the metal ion is not totally donated to the non-metal ion. This electronegativity number difference graph can now be used to classify chemical bonds into three broad groups. The chemical bonds formed when the electronegativity number difference is zero are classified as nonpolar covalent. When the electronegativity number difference is greater than zero but less than 1,7, the bonds are polar covalent. When the electronegativity number difference is greater than 1,7, the bonds are classified as ionic. So far in this series, we have used different models of chemical bonding to describe the overall effect of the electrostatic forces. These forces contribute to the type of bonding, the strength of bonding, and the shape of the molecules or lattice formed. In our next three lessons, we will focus on these geometrical factors in more detail. Now for today's task. Use Pauling's electronegativity numbers to classify the chemical bonds formed in each of these compounds. Water, methane, hydrogen fluoride, and carbon dioxide. Yeah.